Welcome back to another episode of the Deep Six Wrestling Podcast. It is Monday, January 16th, uh, and I'm Ryan, and good to go over what happened this weekend at Hard to Kill for Impact Wrestling. Um, yeah, uh, uh, it was the first of the pay-per-views for Impact this year, uh, and you know, there are two marquee matches on here. Um, the Bully Ray and Josh Alexander match uh, for the Impact World title, uh, and then the title versus career match uh, between uh, Jordan Grace and Mickey James. Um, and, you know, I think both of them delivered. Uh, and I think uh, most of the car- undercard, uh, and the rest of the card, I should say, uh, also delivered. Um, but before we go too far into this, uh, make sure to subscribe to the podcast on any of the different platforms um, of your podcast listening pleasure. Uh, we're on basically all of them at this point. Uh, also subscribe to our YouTube, the Deep Six Wrestling Podcast, and uh, follow us on Twitter at Deep Six Wrestling. Um, So yeah, uh, we start off with the pre-show as always. Uh, The pre-show was supposed to be uh, the Death Dolls, Taya Valkyrie, um, Rosemary, and Jessica versus Giselle Shaw, Tasha Steeles, and uh, Savannah Evans. Um, That match was not aired on the pre-show. It wasn't aired on the main show either. So very confused about that. There's no mention about it uh, on the show. There's no mention about it on uh, Twitter or anything like that. Um, Just that it it didn't happen. It wasn't aired. Um, They were advertising for it up to two hours before the show started. Um, Then uh, Rosemary and Taya and I believe Jessica had all tweeted out about the match or retweeted things about the match leading up to it. Um, saying, hey, don't forget to tune into the, the pre-show. Don't, we're going to have a big match th- uh, on it. Um, going to war, all this stuff. Uh, and then didn't happen, on or didn't wasn't aired or anything like that. Um, after the show, um, people were tweeting, like, what happened in this match. Um, Ty Valkyrie point, point out that it did happen. Um and originally said, like, said to somebody, oh, I guess you didn't tune into the pre-show or early enough, uh, and people were like, it wasn't aired on the pre-show, like, we watched from once it started, once it ended, and she's like, oh, I guess things must have started too early, uh, yeah, it, weird, um, no clue what happened, um, but yeah, so if you want to see that match, um, maybe it'll be thrown up on, like, if, Maybe they'll throw it up on YouTube or on BTI or something to make up for it. Since, again, they were advertising it. And it'd be weird if... It seemed like this was going to be the blow-off match of this feud. Um, so it'd be weird if, you know, nothing happens and they they just move on to a whole nother feud um, without pointing out, like, what happened with this. Um there were still two matches on the pre-show. One of them was um, the six-man match, uh, which we basically, uh, or I basically had called an X-Division match, basically, just because of who was all in it. Um, there was a change to this match as well. Um, originally, it was supposed to be Action Mike Jackson, um, Mike Speedball Mike Bailey, Kushida, Angels, um, Bupinder and, um, drawing a blank on who, oh, and Yuya Yamura, um, Bupinder was not in this match, instead, uh, Delirious replaced him, uh, no mention on why the change for this either, um, but, you know, card subject to change and all that, um, Honestly, I think this change kind of was for the better. Not saying that, you know, Bupinder's not a good wrestler or anything. I thoroughly enjoy him. But it added a different element to this match. Uh, since Delirious and Yuya had been teaming and working together 
um, of late in Impact. Uh, throughout this match, the two kept on doing tag team maneuvers and double team offense uh, against some of the other competitors. Um, so that definitely added a little twist to this. Um, there were some really good matches. I, if you're going to kick off a show, this is a great way to kick it off. Um, because, you know, X Division. Um, Kushida, uh, when he came out, uh, went, like, straight over to action Mike Jackson. Like, <laughs> bow to him, uh, tap him on the shoulder, pat him on the back. He was very, it seemed like he was a big fan of action Mike Jackson. Uh, and they would work together uh, at d- different points in this match as well. Um, one of the big points of this match, uh, Mike Bailey, uh, started to do his kicks, uh, the, like, high kicks, uh, high rapid kicks, um, to, I believe, uh, Delirious at this point, um, that was pretty er uh, early on, um, action Mike Jackson, while this is going on, um, is walking the ropes old school style, um, with Alan Angels and goes, or Angels, since, you know, the, uh, the design is all one, one name characters at this point, uh, goes almost all the way around the entire ring while there's stuff still going on in, uh, inside the ring. Uh, so that was cool. Um, another part in this match, I think a little bit earlier, if I remember, uh, Mike Bailey and Action Mike Jackson were going at it, um, Action Mike Jackson throw uh, kind of Irish whips, um, speedball into the corner. Speedball jumps over the ropes onto the the uh, the ring post uh, and does a moonsault onto the rest of the competitors uh, who are on the ground. Um, or uh, and I thought that looked good. Um, very. Uh, you didn't really. Uh, recognize that like the rest of the competitors were down there at first based off the camera angle so I thought that looked really cool that you know that happened but then action Mike Jackson doesn't want to be one-upped so he goes <laughs> and does a suicide dive and if you don't know who action Mike Jackson is action Mike Jackson is an independent wrestler who is I believe they said he turned 70 uh, 73 or 74 years old last week uh, in 2022 Um, so seeing that, you know, not something you see every day. Um, yeah, it's, it's also weird seeing, you know, a much, much older man who, you know, he's not, he's not as fast paced as like Speedball or, uh, Delirious or Yuya or Kushida, but he's holding his own with these guys. Uh, and that's pretty impressive, uh, especially for somebody who, you know, He's not a big name. He's an indie guy. Uh, doesn't really, he, to my knowledge, he doesn't wrestle in, in a lot of big air, uh, big promotions. I think he's done GCW before, uh, and then he does Impact. Uh, commentary made sure to point out that uh, he made his, uh, he, he wrestled in this same arena back in the 80s for WCW. Um, so he's, he's been going, he's been going strong. Um, Kenny King would then come out and attack Mike Bailey while Mike Bailey was up on the top, uh, uh, the top rope trying to hit a move. Um, I believe it was probably going to be Ultima Weapon, um, but couldn't do that anymore. Uh, and then we'd go back into the ring, uh, and Kushida goes to the top rope. Um, there's a few guys at, at the top at this point, um, and he kind of fights them all off, gets Alan Angels, up, it, it's just him and Angels up there at this point now, and he hits him with the hoverboard lock, uh, for, and keeps it in, and Kushida has won. Uh, it's not a number one, they didn't say it was a number one contenders match or anything like that, just a six man match, um. But it definitely shows Kushida's back. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where he goes from here, how long he's going to be around. Uh, we know that he's going to be in the U.S. at least through March, or maybe he goes back to Japan and then comes back uh, in March because he's got indie dates lined up. 
for the, uh, for March. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, what he is up to. Uh, we also got the announcement later on in the night, if you're watching AEW or on Twitter on AEW, that Kushida is challenging uh, Darby Allen for the TNT title. So he's making sure to go as many places as possible uh, right now while he's in America. So cool. Um, the other match that we got on the pre-show uh, was a match that they were advertising, again, up to a few hours before the show. Um that was going to be on the main show. Uh, it was Black Tarus versus Trey Miguel for the X Division title. Uh, Crazy Steve starts off this, this match with his weirdo promos that he does for Black Tarus before Black Tarus comes out. Um, but he, he does the Friday the, the 13th uh, sounds. Uh, the, like the stuff. Um I'm glad I just did that on this podcast. I'm, it's been what I've wanted to do all my life. Um, yeah, so uh, Crazy Steve and Black Trues come out, uh, it go, and, or Black Trues comes out uh, to not to Decay's theme. He goes back to his old uh, Impact theme that he, like, occasionally he'll bring out. Like, I don't remember the last time I've heard it. Um, and his own Titan Tron. Um, so that was, that was cool. Uh, we also get Trey coming out. Um, I don't remember if he's been coming out to this for all, uh, since he's turned heel or not, but I think this is a new theme. Um, I, I just don't remember it, uh, from the other matches I've seen, uh, since he's, his heel turn. Um, so yeah, uh, I, interesting theme. Um, definitely much different than his previous themes. Um, yeah, um, again, it, when it comes to the X Division guys, you're not gonna, it, it's very rare that you're gonna miss, and this is a really good match as well, um, crazy, or Black Tarus, uh, continues to seem like he's gaining momentum and gaining momentum with the crowd, um, the crowd was super behind him throughout this, um, there were some moments where it was back and forth, Trey, it, like some pe some of the crowd was for Trey, some of the crowd was for Black Tarus, but throughout most of it, it seemed like it was more a Black Tarus favored crowd. Um, we'll get into the crowd, I'll talk about the crowd later, because there were some moments that the crowd was just very weird. Um, yeah, um, but... Uh, there's some, again, really cool spots in here, most of them towards the end. Um, Black Trues and Trey were up on the top rope, and they I don't know what the move was. It looked to me like a burning hammer off the top rope <laughs> that Black Trues hit on Trey, and I was... I, I was aghast. I thought that was fantastic. I thought that could be a finisher. Um looked very devastating crowd was ex ex they thought that was the ending of this match it was not Trey would kick out um Taurus would then also kick out of uh Trey's new finisher the lightning spiral um and that got a big pop as well They're like, oh man he, he's, he's gonna do it he's gonna pick up the win uh so Trey immediately goes to the outside uh, after getting out of a destination hellhole, um, and, uh, having to roost down, he goes, grabs this can of paint, comes inside the ring, uh, just shaking it in full view of the ref, so that the ref will take the can of paint from him, and instead of just throwing the can of paint to the outside, or rolling it out of the ring, or even putting it in your pocket, the ref just disappears, to, I guess, give it to the commentator, or the announce table, or the ring announcer table, um, because Trey just brings out another one, uh, while, he, uh, um, Tarus has him up for, uh, a destination hellhole again, uh, he sprays Tarus in the eyes, um, and hits another lightning spiral, and Trey Miguel retains, uh, Crowd was not very happy about that. Um, Trey sells 
being a heel really well. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed his heel run so far. Uh, considering we haven't really seen that from him uh, since he's been in Impact, uh, I was a bit shocked that we got it the heel turn last uh, towards the end of last year. Um, and now that he has it, or he has this new edge to him, um, it, it, it's working really well. Uh, it's a new layer on him. Uh, and yeah, it's also helped Black Truce gain a lot of support. Uh, from the fans, and we'll see where it builds to, but it felt like this was not the ending of this feud, considering um, we've got another episode of blatant cheating. Um, but we'll get back to that bec- uh, because we have to go to our main show, and the main show starts off with a tribute to Don West, the 10 Bell Salute. Uh, everybody is, uh, from backstage is out there for this. Um, and then we go right into our mate, our first match of the night. It is Bully Ray versus Josh Alexander in a full metal mayhem match. Um, Bully Ray comes out, uh, he's getting some boos, but there's also a lot of cheers for him as well. Um, which, you know, top heel in your company, I guess, I guess cause you're a legend, you can get that, but very odd. Um. And he starts coming out, and then he goes, he's like halfway down the ramp, and instead of getting in the ring, he's like, nope, going back. And he just hides on the top of the stage, or like on the side of the stage. Um, and then Josh comes out, he has like a little kind of special entrance, uh, or at least a special intro to his entrance. Um and then Josh comes out, and as he's making his way down the ramp, uh, he enters from the same side that Bully Ray is hiding in. Uh, apparently, he didn't see Bully Ray. Uh, Bully Ray just gets up, stands up, walks behind him, hits him with a chain, uh, and they start brawling. Uh, and this becomes the Bully Ray I'm going to just beat the shit out of Josh Alexander uh, moment uh, of the match. Uh, or of the night, I guess, because this isn't part of the match. Uh, the ref does not ring the bell. Um, nothing happens. Uh, they just continue to brawl. Uh, Bully just taking control. Busts Josh open. Josh is bleeding profusely out of his head. Um, and he, Bully Ray asks Josh to quit a few times. Uh, just he says, just give me the title, all this stuff. Uh, Josh would eventually get uh, the match, uh, or get back into the ring. Um, the ref would ask him if he, he was going to be able to uh, go. Josh says, ring the bell. So they do. So yeah, so Bully Ray uh, and Josh, finally th- this match starts uh, in the ring. Bully just keeps on attacking Josh uh, once the bell rings. Um, he just beating the crap out of him, uh, gets a table into the ring, uh, hits a bully bomb on Josh through the table, uh, and looks like he's very confident that he's just won the match, but uh, Josh kicks out at two. Uh, Bully would continue to beat down Josh, uh, but Josh would finally start coming back. Um, He would bring in chairs, start beating the crap out of Bully some more. Um, Bully would do his weird oversells of just screaming out in pain uh, very loudly um, and yelling, holy shit, this hurts. Um, uh, Josh would bring in some thumbtacks, throw them all on the, the ground uh, or in the middle of the mat um, and look like he's going to take control. It looks like he's going to win. Lowers the, the straps of the singlet um, and... Uh, out come the good hands, uh, Jason Hotch and John Schuyler, Bully's partners in crime, um, they beat up on Josh, uh, Bully sta- gets back up, um, and tells them to get ready for it, uh, and they hit him with a, th- uh, Josh with the 3D, uh, into the thumbtacks, um, and... Bully goes for the pin. Josh kicks out at two. Um, 
good hands then tie Josh up uh, with zip ties um, and Bully threatens to attack him um, with a garbage can um, but he keeps on looking off into the distance um, and they don't say why it's just very weird like he, he like he's waiting for something to happen um, and then all of a sudden the camera pans to where he's looking uh, and Josh Alexander's wife is rushing down to the ring from the, the crowd um, f- fighting off security guards um, she gets in the ring gets on her knees and pleads for bully to, to not do this and to just fight him uh, to just finish finish the match normally don't 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 try to kill Josh in front of everybody uh, bully says, I I need more, I need you to beg, I want you to cry, I want to see real tears, um, and so she, she seems like she's crying, she seems like she, she's, this is real to her, um, and Bully Ray's like, this isn't enough, I want, I want, I want the wedding ring, give me your wedding ring, um, and she's like, no, I, I can't, I can't do that, uh, and he's like, give it to me or else, uh, and she says, no, I can't. And he's like, okay, well, you die then. Uh, he grabs, the, he gets the trash can. Looks like he's going to whale her on the head with the trash can. She low blows Bully, uh, to which he, again, oversells to shit. Um, and Josh uh, is able to, uh, she gets Josh out of the zip ties, grabs, uh, or she also hits a sliced bread uh, uh on bully into the thumbtacks um and then grabs a chair for her gets a chair for josh she throws the chair at bully uh and josh hits the other the chair into his face um they would then put uh bully ray onto uh a table and there was this big ass ladder that josh teased he was going to go through or he was going to jump off of earlier on the mat in the match um, but Bully flipped him off of it uh, in, onto the, the ropes. Um, Josh now is back onto the top of the, the ladder, uh, and he jumps off the top uh, onto Bully and the table. Um, this is probably the most high-flying thing we've ever seen Josh do. The crowd audibly gasps about this. Uh, it's all for him. Uh, and Bully kicks out too. Uh, but he wouldn't last much longer as Josh would transition right into uh, the ankle lock and Bully would tap out. And yeah, uh, this is not how I expected this match to go. Um, I thought there'd be some interference and stuff like that, but uh, I did not think that we were getting uh, Josh to retain here. Uh, and because of this, I have no idea who's going to be the one to knock him off. Um, it seems like there's somebody, uh, lying in wait and wants him, uh, but I don't know, uh, based off of the path that Impact is going, uh, and has events planned for the rest of, uh, the, the winter and into the spring, uh, if that's going to happen sooner or if, uh, they're going to wait on this and Josh is just going to have this incredible run leading up to, or coming out through the year um overall i thought this was a a surprisingly good match um it's it was definitely different from most josh alexander matches um but in a good way i I thought that um he he meshed really well here uh with this uh different type of match um and the fact that he beat bully right it's another notch in his cap uh, taking down, you know, the impact legend of sorts. Uh, and it'll be interesting, like I said, and it'll be interesting to see what happens with him next. It'll also be interesting to see if Bully sticks around uh, and what's next for him. Um, after this, we go to um, our tag title match. Um, but before we can get into the match, uh, Mickey James is backstage with Tara and Raven talking about her career. Um, Tara is very, you know, 
supportive of Mickey. You know, you're not going to, you're definitely, you're Mickey James. You're going to win this. Your career's not ending yet. Raven comes in. He's just like, hey, I heard it was going to be your last match tonight. It could be your last match tonight. So, you know, I brought you into the company uh, at the beginning. So, you know, I guess I should be here for the end. Uh, I hope you don't lose. I don't think you're going to lose, but you could lose. Uh, and so I want to be here for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good old Raven. Um, so yeah, tag title match. It is the four, uh, four way elimination match, um, between Heath and Rhino, uh, the major players, Ace and Bay and the Motor City Machine Guns. Um, yeah, uh, this was, I don't know how to say this in a way that doesn't make it sound like I didn't like this match, but considering part of who was in this match, parts of it were really good, parts of it were really just meh, um, and I understood the story was to try to, you know, the, the Mercy Machine Guns kind of didn't want to get involved until the end but you know you're you're it's a fatal it's a four-way elimination match you could tag in the other teams uh like teams just seem to not want to tag in the Motor City Machine Guns but wanted to tag everybody else in um which was weird um Heath and Rhino end up getting eliminated first by the major players um the major players would then fight with Bullet Club for a while uh, before uh, Ace and Bay would hit uh, the Art of Finesse and the Fold uh, to pin the major players and eliminate them. Uh, and so it was down to Ace and Bay and Motor City Machine Guns. And it looked like Ace and Bay were going to win again. Uh, they had it lined up for the Fold and the Art of Finesse again. Uh, but the major players come back at uh into the, the ring and beat them up uh, and then try to beat up Mercy Machine Guns, but Mercy Machine Guns kind of fight them off. Um, and in all this confusion, uh, they end up hitting the, uh, the dirt bomb on Chris Bay to pick up the win. Um, I thought this was very weird that, you know... The major players seem like their biggest com issue is with the Murder City Machine Guns, but then they kind of help the Murder City Machine Guns retain by attacking the people that would have beaten them for the titles. Um, and, yeah. Um, it, it, this was odd. Um, wasn't, a, again, wasn't a bad match, just wasn't a great match either and I think with all the t with at least three of the teams that were in here I thought it would could be a very good match um and it just kind of felt like it was it was there um Mercy and Machine Guns retaining made sense because it was going to be their uh first big defense of the titles um but by beating technically all almost all the teams besides whatever the tag team is going to be for the design and I guess Yuya and uh, Delirious and um, trying to think if there's any other teams the uh, Raj Singh and Shira and Johnny Swinger and uh, Zicky Dice uh, and I guess Crazy Steven Black Tarus. Uh, so I guess there's some teams, but like none of them scream out major title contenders. Um, so yeah, it just felt uh, like this was a very underwhelming match, especially after the high that we were just on from the Josh and Bully match. Um, but the, this isn't done. This, I, this situation isn't done, it seems, because... As the Murder State Machine Guns are celebrating, they're walking up the entrance ramp. Out come, or ta uh, uh, Frankie Kazarian's music hits. And Frankie Kazarian comes out and stands on the top of the entrance ramp. And I was like, "What? what what's going on here? Like, are we getting, or, or is Frankie going to challenge these two? Because uh, the only thing that would make sense would be like Frankie and Christopher Daniels. 
which would be absolutely wild. Uh, but no, Frankie just shakes their hands, heads to the ring, grabs a mic, uh, and starts telling a story uh, about how, you know, things. when he, he came back to Impact, he had one thing on his mind. He wanted to go for the big one. Um, and he had a pretty good year last year. He won the X Division title. He got to challenge uh, Josh for the big title. Um, and moral of the story is that, you know, he wanted to stick around. And he has he announces he has signed back with Impact and that he is coming home. Uh, this gets a big rousing ovation. This was shocking to basically everybody. Like, what the hell just happened? Uh, aren't you signed to AEW? Well, as this was taking place, um, PW Insider, I believe, first reported uh, that Frankie had asked for his uh, release from his AEW contract, and AEW had granted it. Um, and that he had signed a long-term deal with Impact Wrestling. Um, so yeah, got a, a, a new slash old uh, face back in Impact. So uh, very cool. Um, it'll be interesting to see where Kaz fits in. Uh, I think that there's a lot of places that Kaz can go. Uh, he, I mean, he still is really good. Uh, we saw how good he was last year, having at least... Two or three really good matches in Impact in his short time that he was there. Uh, him and Mike Bailey had a really good match for the X Division title. Again, still don't think that he should beat Mike Bailey for the title, but to each their own. Um, and then he had a, a absolute fantastic match um, with Josh Alexander for the title. Um, and yeah, I, like I said, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, what Kaz has uh, planned, but it does seem like he wants to stick around, uh, and he definitely wants to keep going for the world title, so it'll be interesting to see. Um, after this, we have Moose versus Joe Hendry for the um, the Digital Media t Championship, and this is where the crowd really starts to get weird. Um, it makes sense a little bit because, um, you know, they always keep on talk or keep talking about how Moose is a former Atlanta Falcons football player. They're in Atlanta. Uh, so of course he'll have some home support. Uh, but Joe Hendry comes out. Um, he's got mostly cheers at the beginning of this match. By the end of this match, it is mostly booze for him. And it's not like he cheated or like turned heel or anything like that. It just seemed like people wanted kept on wanting Moose to win, and they thought Moose was going to win, and then by the end of the match, it was like, oh, well, I think Moose should have won the title. I don't. I think I was firm, I'm was i firmly still believing in Joe Hen Hendry. I think that Joe Hendry's fantastic, and I think it makes sense for him to keep this, uh, keep the title uh, and keep going for it, uh, forward with it, because I feel like he can do a lot with it, um, but Getting a little ahead of ourselves here. Um, the uh, co uh, commentary does mention that there are some former Atlanta Falcons players, again, uh, that were teammates with Moose uh, at ringside. Um, I don't remember all of them, but I remember John Abraham was there again. Um, and he was there the last time they, uh, Moose had a pay-per-view match in Atlanta. And, yeah, John Abraham. Um Hendry, uh, at the beginning of this match, begins to cut a promo, but Moose just slaps the mic out from his hands. The crowd eats it up. Um, th and as I said, throughout this match, it, nothing was crazy in this match. Was no no major spots uh, in this. Um, but throughout this match, it just kept on going. The crowd just kept on going more and more for Moose. Um, Moose would then distract the or go out to ringside he would go to uh the ring announce table he would grab the digital media championship and bring it into the ring um the just shows it to the ref the ref would grab it from him would then in, again instead of just sliding it out instead of like telling somebody to come and get it he just 
walks into the corner and is like having a conversation basically uh, before giving the title back because this allows Moose to hit a low blow on Joe Hendry, then line up for the lights out spear. Um, he would then pin uh, Joe Hendry. One, two, three. Moose is the new digital media champion. Uh, he starts to celebrate, but then we've got a new we've got music playing. And Santino Morella has is coming out uh, and his Titan Tron says that he's the director of the th- uh, director of authority, Santino Morella. Now Santi- the uh, Santino had appeared last year uh, at different points in the year uh, as a commentator and he was just himself. He wasn't Santino Morella. He was uh, the person. Uh, Anthony Corelli, um, and you know, didn't have the fake Italian accent, wasn't doing the goofiness. Uh, this is full on Santino Morella. Uh, don't know how they got the, the rights to that, but they, it's not Santino's th- like WWE theme or anything, but it, it's his WWE name. Um, uh, and he's dressed in a FBI jacket that instead of, FBI says DOA, uh, Director of Authority, um, and yeah, he says that he is the he has been put in place uh, while Scott is away, um, and you know he watched that match. He saw that there was cheating afoot, uh, and he doesn't like cheating, and so he restarts the match. Now. Because of this, this is going back to the Black Tarus and Trey thing. I think that, you know, if this is his thing, I don't like cheating. Um, I'm going to overturn cheating. I think uh, we could get another match between those two because of that. Um, which, I, again, they, they have really good chemistry. So I'd like that. Uh, but we go back into the ring. The match restarts. Uh, Joe Hendry hits the standing ovation. And he pins Moose, one, two, three, and Joe Hendry has retained his title. Um, the crowd seemed to not, at least part part of the crowd did not seem to enjoy the ending of this match. Um, there were vocal boos that you could hear, um, and yeah, um, I don't know what to th- I I feel like Moose. And Joe Hendry could continue this feud. It makes sense. He, Moose technically won the title uh, and then had it taken from him. Um, so it would make sense if he wanted a rematch. I feel like he, he could get that, but we'll see. Um, after this, we get uh, a Kenny King promo uh, about why he attacked Mike Bailey. Uh, he's says, you know, I told when the the pit fight got announced, I told Mike Bailey, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to be here. Uh don't wrestle, don't do anything. Keep your mind focused uh because pit fight pit fight is not going to be the same as a r- real wrestling match. Uh there's not not going to be moves, there's not going to be spots. Uh you're not going to be the doing uh pro wrestling stuff it's going to be a fight um but you're still out here not paying attention you're not focusing on the pit fight and so i had to take it out on you and i had to make sure that you knew uh and get would get your mind focused for this match uh or else you would get punished and this is your punishment basically uh, and that he is going to knock out mike bailey uh on Thursday in the pit fight. Um, after this, we have our number one contenders match um, for the knockouts title uh, between Taylor Wilde, um, Masha Slamovich, Deanna Prazo, and Killer Kelly. Um, as everybody comes out, crowd is easily mostly behind uh, Taylor Wilde. Um, it, in our predictions for this match uh, in Deep Six, nobody chose Masha Slamovich. 
Uh, and it felt like Masha was like the main focus of this match, but it was mainly because her and Killer Kelly just kept on trying to get at each other. Um, and the crowd ate that up every time that they were locking horns. Um, Killer Kelly was in it's, uh, Friday the 13th inspired gear. Um, so that was cool. Um, or no, she was in Nightmare on Elm Street gear. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a uh, Freddy Krueger inspired gear. Uh, yeah, had to rethink that for a second. Anyway, um, uh, some cool spots in this. Um, De- uh, while Masha and Killer Kelly were brawling on the outside, Deanna hit a baseball slide on both of them. Um, Masha, uh, or then, um, uh, Taylor Wilde would come over to try to brawl, uh, and try to f- bring the, keep the fight going on over there. Uh, and Masha would end up going to the top rope, hit a diving cannonball on all three com- uh, competitors. That was good. Um, there was some dueling submissions, uh, throughout this match. Um, we had a, at one point, Deanna, uh, had a, uh, ankle lock or uh, a single leg Boston crab locked in on, uh, Killer Kelly. Um, Taylor Wilde then grabbed the other leg and did her own Boston crab. Um, and so Deanna and Taylor just kept on fighting while this was going on. Um, that looked good. Um, Kelly kept on trying, teasing that she was going to hit, uh, put people into the, the killer clutch. Um, she finally gets it in on Deanna and it looks like that's going to be it. Um, but Taylor Wilde, uh, gets Masha Slamovich into, uh, some sort of, uh, submission next door. Um, but, Masha fights out of it, grabs Taylor Wilde, <laughs> hits the snowplow on top uh, on Taylor, on top of Deanna and Kelly to break up the submission, uh, and it would also give Masha the win. So Masha is back in the title picture. Uh, she is the number one contender, and I think this is a very interesting idea. I don't know how great of an idea it is to have Masha go right for the title again after having a pretty lengthy feud to end the year last year with, uh, for the title and her losing twice. I don't know if Mickey's going to, if it would make sense for Mickey to drop the title immediately after getting it and saving her career. I I don't think that would make sense. Um, but I also don't know if you want to have Masha go 0 for 3 for her world title shots. Um, So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Um, After this, we have Rich Swan and Steve Macklin's uh, Falls Count Anywhere in Atlanta match. Um, Raven has joined commentary for this. um, And we start off backstage in what looks like a parking garage um, with some of the worst audio issues uh, that... I can remember an impact, um, in quite some time, um, impact or Gia Miller's going to interview Rich Swan, but Steve Macklin attacks. There's no, uh, audio from that side. Um, so we don't know what was being talked about there. Um, and then there's just echoing throughout, uh, as they start brawling, uh, where it's just commentary is echoey. Um, the the audio of Macklin and uh, Swan's fighting is sem- is kind of echoey and grainy as well. Um, so then they swap back into the r- arena real quick, um, and then come back over to the guys fighting, um, and it s- somewhat fixed it. I don't know what they did, but uh, the graininess was gone. The yeah, echoing for commentary was there for a little bit more, um, but there wasn't a echoing that like audio echoing, uh, for, um, the competitors, which is good. Um, some 
there were some unique spots here again since they were fighting in a parking garage basically um we had macklin throw a sandbag at rich swan's head um they end up brawling all the way to the outside of the arena and and this garage um with rich swan hitting a cutter onto the sidewalk um raven at this point while they're out on the streets of atlanta um says that he hopes a car hits both hits one of them or both of them um swan and macklin would then start brawling back into the uh the parking garage and a as a car would try to come up and exit the parking garage um they would yell at the car both of them uh before swan or uh macklin would hit uh swan into said car very lightly um then would throw rich swan into uh some barricades uh and kind of spear him through them um there's also the top of a uh, table that was just being used as a weapon by macklin at the beginning of this match um swan would then get a shovel and start using it on uh, Macklin as they brawled back into the arena. Um, they get into the arena on the ramp. Um, there's Macklin would throw uh, Swan into the ramp because the ramp was elevated. Um, like uh, some of the uh, AEW ramps are, uh, and some of the uh, ramps for Impact are when they're in smaller uh, venues like this. Um, where it, the ramp kind of connects to the st- uh, directly to the stage. Um, Swan would go and hit a pretty nice uh, uh, dive onto Macklin from the stage as well. Um, this would, brawl would continue. Uh, Macklin would hit a, lig- a running Liger bomb on the outside. I don't think they ever got into the ring on this match made sense they fully went with the uh the falls count anywhere idea um and macklin would end up they'd brawl into the crowd some more and then it's very hard to describe this so i'm going to try my best but based off of the arena that they were in there were uh to get into like the main part of the arena, I guess. Um, there are stairs coming up from under underneath. Um, but because of that, and I guess because of, you know, they want to protect people, uh, they, they had a gate in front of this. And then on, uh, so they opened the gate uh, so that they could brawl down these steps. But on top of the steps, there was also a ramp uh, so people didn't have to, I guess, f- kind of like s- feel where the the uh, the steps would be because it was kind of dark in that area. Um, and uh, Macklin hits his KIA finisher on Rich Swan on the ramp um, and pins him one, two, three, and uh, yeah, Macklin has won uh, and he celebrates by calling out Josh Alexander. Uh, saying he's got his eyes on him, uh, he wants next. Um, yeah, after this we had Jonathan Gresham versus Eddie Edwards. Um, this was a pretty good. This was a. a eh, my my words are uh, trying to fool me here, but yeah, this was a really good match as well. Uh, very technical, uh, technically sound, I should say, as expected in a Jonathan Gresham match. Um, Commentary talks about how Gresham hasn't lost in Atlanta in years, um, and he hasn't been pinned in impact. Um, well, that changed because uh, Eddie Edwards would end up beating uh, Jonathan Gresham a bit surprisingly. Um, and as Eddie Edwards goes to celebrate, the lights go off. We've got the lightning, the thunder strikes again. And then they come back on, 
and PCO is in the ring <laughs> and his face is covered in sand and he is spitting the sand everywhere because he apparently filled his mouth with it before he got into the ring. Uh, this is, again, the last time we had seen PCO was back uh, when uh, Honor No More kind of exploded uh, and ended uh, last year uh, in Vegas, uh, and they buried PCO in the desert. Um, so that's what's why he has this sand, apparently. <laughs> um He's, he has risen, uh, and he is still covered in the sand. And this man is just spitting with every breath that this man is taking. There's just sand going everywhere. This is ridiculous looking, uh, but I'm all for it. I'm glad PCO's back. Crowd popped heavily for this. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the PCO and Eddie feud can continue. Um commentary or we would then get an ad for rebellion and rebellion has been announced for uh ontario Can uh, or, or not ontario uh toronto uh canada um which i think is in ontario i think pretty sure um so yeah we have back-to-back -back uh live events uh for uh impact that will be in Canada, uh, with, I believe, Sacrifice being in March, uh, in Windsor, Canada, uh, and then, uh, in April, we will be having, uh, Rebellion in Canada, uh, so yeah, interesting stuff, um, and that's why I said I don't see Josh losing the title anytime soon, just because I think they're gonna want to have, uh, the Canadian uh, face of the company uh, still as champion uh, going into those events. Um, maybe he loses at Rebellion and you get like a big heel heat on whoever beats him, but I don't think that he's going to lose on, you know, an Impact Plus show like Sacrifice uh, or No Surrender in February, I believe, uh, is the next one. Um, and again, I, I think it'd be very difficult or I, 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 to me, I don't think that Josh is going to lose at rebellion, uh, now that's in Canada. Uh, so yeah, this is going to be a r extremely long reign. He's already the longest reigning, uh, impact world champ of all time, um, including TNA, uh, championship, I believe. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Josh, uh, who is the one to dethrone him. But this would take us to our main event is Mickey James versus Jordan Grace for the Knockouts World title. If Mickey loses, she has to retire. Um, uh, Mickey has a special entrance uh, that is, uh, has the, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, the Mattapony Drum and Dancers, a Native American tribe, I guess, um, who... Uh, she's all in her native garb as well. Uh, and they dance around her, they drum around her, uh, and then it transitions into her normal theme. I thought this was pretty cool. Uh, and commentary keeps on talking about how like this is the most open she's ever been about her her native heritage, um, and she's wearing it on her sleeve. Her whole family's here, and so it pans to the, her family. Her parents are there. Her son is there. You know who's not there? Nick Aldis. Nick Aldis wasn't there with them. That's fucked up. Um, yeah. I uh, just wanted to throw out some random Nick Aldis shade. Um, Jordan comes out. Crowd pretty behind Jordan as well. Um, but everybody's mainly behind Mickey. Um, throughout this match, anytime Mickey was in control, crowd was super behind her. Uh, anytime that... Jordan was taking control. They were accepted of it. They liked it because it was a good match. Um, but they, they don't. They didn't want Mickey's uh, career to end. Um, Mickey would hit the uh, uh, Mick DDT at one point. Jordan would kick out. The crowd was like, "Oh, it, it, it's going to end, isn't it?" Uh, Jordan um, looked at one point like she had. Uh, 
was going to make Mickey pass out, but Mickey would fight out of it. Um, and Mickey would end up picking up the win with the uh, Mick DDT again uh, and would win. And crowd went wild. Uh, Mickey's family would come into the ring with her. Tara and Raven would come into the ring with her to celebrate a little bit. Uh, and yeah, um, Mickey's career is not done. She's the champ. And it'll be seen what happens next. Overall, I thought this was a pretty good show. There were some moments that I was like, eh. Um, the Macklin and Rich Swan match uh, was fun, but a lot of the spots were just, it, it did not feel like it was a pay-per-view match. It just felt like this was a backstage brawl. Um, also, um, again, the tag ma- tag title match just wasn't it for me. Um, I think that other than that, everything felt pretty good, uh, and it'll be interesting to see where we go from here. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for listening. Um, I guess I should say uh, for our predictions for Deep Six, if you follow along with us, uh, I am the new champ. I have beaten Joey. Uh, based off of a tiebreaker. The tiebreaker was uh, how long uh, we thought uh, Josh versus Bully was going to last. Um, it went, I believe, 17 minutes almost exactly. Uh, Joey had predicted it would be a 10-minute match. I thought it was going to be a 23-minute, 23 23-second 23 match. So I was closer. I win. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, thank you guys for listening again. And we will be back with another episode of the Impact Power Hour, most likely, uh, this week. Um, And possibly uh, Pat will have another AEW review. So yeah, Uh, thank you guys, and talk to you next time.